Hello and welcome back to the 5 Minute Film Club and I'm finally ready to continue my Halloween series looking at 1995's The Curse of Michael Myers. Thank you very much for watching my video. Please remember to subscribe to the channel to see all of my movie reviews. We start the film six years after the last one, which saw a gunfight occur at the Haddonfield police station involving the man in black, in which Michael Myers escaped. Well, we learn at the start of Curse that the man in black also abducted little Jamie Lloyd, Myers' niece if you forget, that night. Jamie at the start of this film gives birth and is helped to escape by her midwife. She's been held in the basement of Smith's Grove Sanitarium by what we later find out is called the Cult of Thorn, a druid-like cult that wouldn't have felt out of place in Halloween 3. We then go to catch up with Donald Pleasance as Dr. Sam Loomis writing his memoirs in a little cottage. He is visited by an old friend and head of Smith's Grove, Dr. Wynn, played by Mitch Ryan. Wynn wants Loomis to come back and take over from him as head of Smith's Grove. Quite why this visibly younger and fitter man is coming to <laughs> Donald Pleasance's Dr. Sam Loomis He's been in fires, he's really unstable, but quite why? Why are women to believe that Loomis will fall for this? I don't know. Anyway, Jamie escapes with her child and Michael pursues her to a bus station that has the radio on but seemingly completely deserted. She calls the radio station to try and ask for help. She, for some reason, doesn't call the police. She calls the radio station. and. On the call, she puts in a vain hope that a very old Dr. Sam Loomis will hear her pleas for help. However, Jamie is actually in luck as Loomis seems to be a fan of this shock jock radio and is listening to the Howard Stern wannabe Barry Sims when Jamie calls in. Also listening is a grown-up Tommy Doyle, played by not grown-up Paul Stephen Rudd, as he is credited here in his first big screen appearance. Tommy Doyle has turned into a somewhat Myers obsessive and quickly records the phone call on his handy reel-to-reel -reel recording system that he keeps in his bedroom. That's perfectly normal for a 90s child, I would think. Back at the bus station, Jamie hides the baby in a cupboard and lures Michael away to a barn, where she is killed by Michael on the most intense piece of farm equipment going. Myers is then furious to find out a roll of toilet paper has been substituted by Jamie for the baby. Enter my first big issue with The Curse of Michael Myers. One of the best things about Halloweens 4 and 5 was Danielle Harris as little Jamie Lloyd, and the production of Curse wanted to bring her back. However, they didn't want to pay her. That's right, the Weinsteins were so tight that they didn't want to pay Danielle Harris to come back as Jamie Lloyd. And then the character is completely treated with utter disrespect and dispatched in the most gory way possible. Meanwhile in Haddonfield we meet the latest Strode family to be staying in the Myers house, which again looks nothing like the Myers house, and that is abusive John Strode, his beaten upon wife Deborah, their son Tim and daughter, and shame of the family, Cara played by Mariana Hagen. She's brought shame on the family by being a teenage mother, not to mention they are also related to the most infamous serial killer of all time. How much can this family take? Cara's son Danny is also having nightmares of a man in black telling him to start killing for a cult. Myers, by this point, has returned to Haddonfield looking for Jamie's baby. Well, that baby has actually been found by Tommy Doyle, who managed somehow to work out where Jamie was by playing the recorded message again. He doesn't enhance it in any way, but by magic of the second time listen, he can pinpoint exactly that there are bus announcements going on in the background. The baby also hasn't cried or been fed in the now busy bus station that is also covered in blood and nobody has decided to notice or clean it up. Again, this film is... Anyway, then in some twisty-turny point of a plot, Loomis and Wynne then suddenly arrive at the site of Jamie's killing, where a giant thorn sign has been scorched onto some bales of hay, and then they go to the hospital where Loomis bumps into Tommy Doyle and the baby. He doesn't talk to Loomis properly, but instead tells him to meet him somewhere else, and then leaves. Yes, I mean that's perfect storytelling really. Loomis then shows up at the Myers house to do what he does best, and that's prophesy doom and scare whoever happens to be around. 
His tactics don't work, as Deborah doesn't leave the house quick enough and is dispatched by Michael. <sighs> then make sure that her drunk, abusive husband gets a fittingly gory death when he shoots so much electricity through John Strode's head that it explodes. <laughs> Lovely. Meanwhile, Tommy, who is intensely creepy throughout this film, is telling Kara and Danny about the Curse of Thorn, and that back in ye olde days, druids would have a child cursed by Thorn, and then they must go on to sacrifice their next of kin. Why? Who knows, and quite frankly, who cares? Tommy then says that Michael carries this Curse of Thorn, and that's why he is fixated with killing off all of his family, and that Jamie's baby is his final sacrifice. It is implied in this film that Michael Myers has... Well, Jamie's baby is Michael's? Um... Hmm... Anyway, at this point, the film then decides that they haven't killed anyone for a bit. The shock drop then dies, is strung up in a tree, there's a Halloween party, it's the first time a Halloween party has been held in years, and um, then Kara's brother is then killed, yes, alongside his girlfriend, while Kara watches through a DSLR across the street. Again, take out these scenes and nothing changes in the plot. Mrs Blankenship, who is Tommy's landlady, and a nice little nod to a character mentioned from Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Well, she's been talking to Danny, and telling him that she was babysitting Michael the night that he killed his sister, and that, like Danny, he heard voices telling him to kill. Kara then returns to save her son, but the man in black is there and chases her until she throws herself out of a window, and we cut to black. At this point, we enter the final act of this film, which was cut about like anything during the year plus that it spent in post-production. None of it makes any sense, but it's still here. Let's deal with it. This is where the film attempts to do justice to all of the mythology that Tommy Doyle has been spouting throughout this rubbish. It's here that we get the revelation that Dr. Wynne, that blink and you miss him character from John Carpenter's original, is actually the mastermind behind Michael Myers and the head of the Cult of Thorn. Michael must now kill the remaining members of his family and pass the curse on to young Danny. I think they must think that Michael is getting a bit too long in the tooth for this killing game, and so young Danny might be a good replacement. Anyway, we get some scenes where there are fetuses in glass jars and green goo and scientists that Michael slaughters in probably the only actually definitively cool moment of this film. It all comes down to Tommy versus Michael in a room with a load of chains and Dr. Sam Loomis then going back inside where we then hear his disembodied scream as the credits roll. Can you see the amount of respect that this film actually pays to the Halloween series and young Daniel Farron's script? that he spent years and years writing. After the utter rejection from audiences The Revenge of Michael Myers received, Halloween series producer Mustafa Rakan wanted to take his time with the next one and make a film that would resolve all the series' hanging threads. Enter brand new screenwriter Daniel Farrens. Alongside with Hal to deal with Michael Myers and bringing him back and tying up all those loose ends, a card also had to deal with some legal issues. Now, I haven't fully been able to understand the ramifications of these legal battles, but essentially, Mustafa Ricard sat on the series too long, and it suddenly came up for sale and was bought by Dimension Films, um, Miramax to be precise, and um, that was owned by the Weinsteins. And so suddenly, Mustafa Ricard had to enter into a partnership with the Weinsteins to create a new Halloween film. The relationship between Farron's a card and a card son Malik versus the Weinsteins, well, it was not harmonious at all. And somewhere in the middle was the director, Joe Chappelle, just trying to keep his head down, make a film, get his money, and for God's sake, move on. Watching Halloween 6 is a bit like waking from a dream and trying to tell somebody about it, but the more you talk about it, the foggier the details become. During the production, you have the Weinstein side of things coming up against Mustafa and his son. After the initial cut was made, the Weinsteins were so unhappy that they did a load of reshoots, adding in more graphic scenes, demanding a new score with electric guitar, and also changing the third act completely. The version that they didn't like, this original cut, 
fell into fan legend called The Producer's Cut. Now this version I've really always wanted to see and I've never been able to track down. It's not available in the UK. If any of you out there has a version, a decent HD version of this, please let me know in the comments down below if you'd be willing to send it to me because I've got an itch that I want to scratch and that is watching The Producer's Cut. But reading about the film online, essentially I don't think this is any lost masterpiece for anybody. The one thing that the producer's cut has got going for it, however, is actually Donald Pleasance. Donald Pleasance died directly after filming completed. And so when they went to try and reconstruct the film, or the Weinsteins went in and cut it about and recreated a third act, they couldn't go to Loomis. They, they couldn't add anything else in. They could just subtract or change the context of it um, with stand-ins and using his voice in different ways it's you can really tell that it's been hacked about particularly the end of this film and it's such a shame that this is donald pleasance's final film in the series and that he's clearly unwell and it's just a great shame that this is how the great man of the series goes out towards the end of the filming joe chappelle was also called across to another dimension property Hellraiser 4 that was having difficulties and so those chains in that room at the end I think essentially they set up they had no ending for this film from what I gather and so the crew from Hellraiser 4 came over they set up a load of chains they had about 30 seconds to shoot a pan down to Michael Myers' mask with a needle in it and that's the end of the film doesn't know what it means uh, but we just need to get this out into cinemas because otherwise we're sitting on a load of money that potentially we could be making from this pile of rubbish. Now Daniel Farrens was incredibly upset with the process of this and so was Malika Card. They saw their vision being completely trampled by you know the, the powers that be being the Weinsteins. They were very green in the business they they thought that you know their ideas as producers and writers would mean something when it eventually got to filming and cutting this film. And they discovered the hard way that really sometimes you've just got to pick your own battles and move on. And it's it's a great shame because I believe that Farron's, you know, tried his best. He had an idea, he had a fan idea of tying up absolutely everything to do with the Halloween series and trying to stick that landing in this film just is... It just is completely um, shafted by the Weinsteins and you end up with a film that doesn't really make any sense to start with just being turned into a complete puddle of grey mush or green mush maybe green mushy goo is actually the best way to describe this film I will say though that I would rather watch this film than watch Halloween 5 again which I think is the actual low point of this series I just find that film so boring and watching Curse of Michael Myers you see what dilemma the slasher film had gotten itself into by the end of the by, by kind of the late 80s and the mid 90s just before Scream everything before then kind of yeah 87 to 1995 you look at all of the Nightmare on Elm Street's in that period and the Jason films they're all trying to deal with mythologies and supernatural elements that just do not work um, within the context of their killers there some of them are incredibly imaginative and they really should be rewatched I think but they there's a real time and it needed something like scream to come along and kick it back into the public consciousness and into into shape what scream did for halloween was incredibly important namely it brought original star jamie lee curtis into contact with scream creator and architect kevin williamson but more on that next week <laughs> Thank you very much for watching my review of Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers. If you like this film, please let me know why in the comments down below. Have I been too harsh on it? Please remember to subscribe to the channel and like this video. 
because then you'll be able to catch all my other movie reviews. But until next time, I'll say thank you very much for watching and goodbye.